here. So we're going to talk about the use of molecular profiling, genomics, and so this is a, a moving target, so to speak. And I really wanted to pontificate and, and look at the whole landscape of genomic testing and how we incorporate it broadly into cancer care. Uh, for disclosures, I am uh, on Speaker Bureau for Genentech, Clovis, and AstraZeneca, uh, and also uh, uh, serve as an expert witness for Johnson Johnson for uh, talc and ovarian cancer. So, you know, when, when we talk about genomic profiling, you know, individualized therapy, precision medicine, you know, there's a lot of terms that are thrown around. Uh, and I'm not going to read this entire quote, but wanted to point out at the very last two lines that when you talk about intervention, it should be concentrated to those who will benefit, spare and expense, and side effects and from those who will not. And I think that is so key from this definition of precision medicine as we are moving forward. Uh, when you look at the advent of uh, precision medicine and the era, uh, we've, we're, the more we dig, the, the more we find out that the cancer biology is far more complex than we ever really imagined. Started in you know 2000 with the first publication in Cell, the har hallmarks of uh, cancer. Moving forward to the TCGA uh, launch in 2005, <clears throat> and then as we moved over the next you know uh, you know decade. Uh, there were more and more description of how the genetic alterations and subtypes in multiple cancers really played into the carcinogenesis and therapies uh, of those cancers. And then uh, hot off the presses, actually two weeks ago, uh, there was a special issue of Cell, uh, 27 publications of special interest regarding kind of the pan-cancer atlas. Uh, now, I have not pour, poured through all 27 articles yet, but it, it's on my to-do list and very, very informative group of papers that I really think this described the landscape as we move forward. If you look at, you know, agents and, and precision medicine along this era, starting in 1997 as the first, you know, quote-unquote targeted therapy of rituximab, and then you move forward with, you know, Herceptin, uh, Imatinib, and then looking over the 97 to 2016, there's been over 100 FDA-approved, quote-unquote, targeted agents. And so there's a plethora of, of drugs that are available to our patients, which is obviously a good thing, but again, I harken back to we need to make sure we identify those who will benefit uh, while sparing expense, you know, and side effects. So when we talk about individualized therapy, you know, the, the, a patient is a patient and a patient. So for GYN oncology, ovarian cancer patients, everybody looked the same. They all got the same chemotherapy. They all got the same surgery. Uh, and then as we started teasing out, you know, the different differences, we realized that these are not just one group of patients, uh, that they're all are individual. And so in a simplified cartoon where you see that, where you start off with, you know, a group of patients, and then you, you do some molecular profiling, and from that, you hope to discern some prognostic markers and markers of sensitivity to certain agents. And therefore, you line up the, the pink people with the pink pill and the blue with the blue pill and hope to improve on the results that we already have. So as we go through the, the treatment, and y'all please stop me if you have any questions or comments or disagree with anything I say. So, um, you know, our cancer transition of therapy for 70 plus years it was cookie cutter. If someone had a cancer from a certain, you know, origin site, they got the same regimen regardless of any other characteristics, you know, the absence of any biomarkers. Uh, and they pretty much relied on a principle to where that therapy was, quote, slightly more toxic to cancer than it was to normal cells. But that is not effective in all patients, and we saw and we still see in our clinical practice where there are subgroups of patients that will not respond to first-line standard of care. Moving forward, we transition to more histology-based treatment, so it's not necessarily the site of the tumor, but what is the histology that's there, that is, that is uh, you know, the different phenotypes, and we've seen that in our, uh, with different clinical, you know, behavior. It is, quote, more targeted than site-specific treatments, and with examples such as neuroendocrine and, and mucinous tumors, you know, we are treating with chemotherapies that work best in that histologic subtype, but it still lacks some of the molecular markers and specificity that I think that we need. So now, you know, with precision medicine, you know, molecular profiling, we now have a profile, a genetic profile to those patients, even by histology, can be broken down into smaller subsets. And as my 11-year-old daughter says, you know, she doesn't just like MAC, she likes, likes MAC. You know, this is more and more targeted, you know, in regards to the cancer therapy. 
And what we hope is that with these proposed new mechanisms of treatment uh, and identify, identifying certain you know, targets and you know, these, I guess, molecular vulnerabilities that will be able to improve cancer care individually. A more broad sense of our transition, we really went from superstitions, you know, to symptoms, to now signatures in regards to how we're treating patients and how the future of cancer care will likely look. So, you know, I think what's important along this, along this uh, transition, is that we must improve outcomes. And I think as we look back over the past decade, you know, more targeted therapies does not always equate improved outcomes. If we look at the FDA approved drugs from 2002 to 2014, uh, there's a great publication in JAMA looking at, at 71 you know, different agents that were approved over this time frame. The top graph in A is progression-free survival above what the standard of care would give. And so the meeting across this, as you see here in this line, is a gain of 2.5 months in progression-free survival for 71 approved agents. If you look at overall survival for these 71 agents over that time frame, the gain was two months of overall survival compared to standard of care. So as we start looking into this, you know, well, can we by molecular profiling and, and really going in and digging into the details, can we improve on the costs? So this is a, a great graph just showing the cost of, quote, non-responders, patients who don't respond to certain therapy. This first one on top left is, you know, bevacizumab, and that's, I'm not sure you can read that, but that's $3 billion of, of cost, and the red part of that pie is those patients that don't respond. So for Avastin, two-thirds of the patients would quote unquote not respond to that therapy and that's two billion dollars of waste if you will. And so can we improve upon that with molecular therapy to really target those patients and which therapies will be best and I think that's the hope. However, are we really saving money? I showed that the survival is you know 2.5 months of improvement over standard of care uh, for progression-free, two months for overall survival, and, and look at this graph in regards to the year, uh, as you see along the bottom axis, and then this is the monthly cost uh, here on the right. And so for each agent that was FDA approved, the median monthly cost now exceeds $10,000. And so here we are treating most patients maybe six months of therapy to get a two month of overall survival benefit, that's, that's a lot of money in expenditure and, and is it really worth it? You know, it, I think you, that that's debatable and I think it depends on the patient. This is a, a great uh, uh, table from Ramsey. What they did basically was a cost utility analysis. You interview patients, patients with cancer and say, okay, this is the cost that it would, and, and here's the survival, and what survival would you think would be needed for this extra expense? And so just in, in, in cost effectiveness analyses and, and cost utility analyses, there's been a mathematical economic threshold of $150,000 per year for, for a year of survival gain. And so that 150 per life year saved is considered kind of the ethical, economic, and approved uh, threshold. And so for an, an extra 50,000, if you said, well, and this does not patient cost, it's just societal cost of therapy and treatment. If it was $50,000 to get target agent A, how many months of survival would you think would be okay and what you would want in order to justify those costs? And patients with cancer would say about four months you know, 100,000, eight months. And so all the way down to $500,000, you know, how much months of overall survival? They said 40 months. And so let's go back to that graph of the expense where some of these agents are approaching $100,000 per month. They're getting at least six months of that. And we're coming nowhere near what a patient with cancer would want in regards to survival. We've got to do better with that. So are we really saving money? You know, if you look at the uh, health expenditure uh, per capita in, uh, in, uh, you know, across different countries, you can see where USA lies here. Uh, there was a publication came out actually on Tuesday that I saw that actually Italy, my, my, my people, my paisans, 
they actually had the most value-based care in the developed world. Uh, so they, they do a really good job of, of limiting the money that they spend and have outcomes and value-based outcomes uh, that are survivals that equate to nearly everyone. So I think there's some lesson learned in regards to how much we spend and what benefits we're getting. Those outcomes of survival are so important. So back in the USA, I, I love this graph from 99 to 2010. And it's from the bottom green line, and this is a percentage increase. So the bottom green line is just the US you know, GDP uh, had a 3% increase over this time frame. The blue line is healthcare in general, which is a 9% increase. If you go to cancer care, in 2010, we spent $123 billion in cancer care total. Uh, and that was a significant increase of 12 to 18% uh, over this you know, decade. If you look at just cancer drugs themselves, uh, that percentage was 20%. And we spent $55 billion on, on cancer therapy in 2010. So is this you know, what value-based medicine looks like? You know, we're spending a whole lot of money for not much bang for the buck, if you, if you will. So uh, from Dr. Clarkson, who's our avid, uh, a sailor in the group, you know, a smooth sea never makes a skilled sailor. And so I think we've hit a lot of rocks and bumps in the road, you know, with precision medicine and really trying to decide when is it worthwhile? When, is, when are we gonna improve patients' outcomes and how are we gonna be cost savings with this? And, and it's kind of a losing proposition in what we have right now. The research and development company, as they go with biotech to develop a drug, is estimated to cost over $1 billion from the thought, the idea of a drug, to getting the preclinical data, to then doing the trials needed to get approval. It's a billion dollar process. It takes five to 12 years to do, and only 70, excuse me, only five to 25% of those ventures are successful. Well, if you went to any business person in the world and said, this is the stats for developing X, Y, or Z, they would tell you, hell no, I'm not doing this. It's too costly and it's too much of a risk for failure. But it's what we're seeing. And it's really unsustainable from a, uh, in a cost-conscious society with so much emphasis on uh, a value-based medicine. It's not what we need. Now, targeted matched drugs, you know, could it overcome those obstacles? And we'll talk a little bit about that. Before I leave the point of value-based medicine, I'm going to leave some words of Ed Partridge, who was one of my mentors at UAB, a G1 oncologist that now recently retires as a cancer center director. He gives a wonderful talk on you know, the Star Wars of cancer therapy, all these targeted therapies, and man, they're cool. Immunotherapy, and so, I mean, I, it was hard to follow Jennifer Scalise's talk, she's so darn smart. But you know, it's, it's really cool if you can pay attention to it. And, and, and so, but, but if we just took the money that we spend in the United States, and let's focus on three simple things that work. Mammograms for breast, you know, pap smears for cervical cancer, which, which is probably the most disturbing cartoon I saw on the internet is colonoscopy there. I really, I, I mean, I know that's what happens, but I, I just the cartoon itself is a little, um, but, but just if we were, <laughs> it's right. So in, in fact, but this is, this is a screening, you know, yeah, and the vaccine in addition to that. But if we focused on just a screening of this um, and had 100% compliance across the country, we would save 600 lives every day every single day. And so from a value-based medicine on something that is inexpensive as a colonoscopy, pap smear, um, you know, or mammogram, it, it, that's probably what value-based looks like. Now, common cancers, you know, are now a collection of rare, you know, diseases and, and cancers. And I think of, you know, one of the great examples is, is, you know, lung cancer. So it started out as a sing, single disease that then gravitated to histology-based you know, subtyping. And then each histology in and of itself then broke out into you know, multiple genomic profiles on how we treat patients. Um, and you look at this, this has been re relatively rapid where you know, over the past you know, 10 years, it's significantly changed. And one caveat is that it really has made an impact on the survival. So you look at that graph earlier, 71 different drugs. You know, a lot of it, a lot of those success stories you see are actually in the lung cancer literature. And so you dig deeper into this and looking at as, as a great paper in Cell in 2012, looking at the landscape of genomic alterations in uh, non-small cell lung cancer. And what we found is these kind of quote, uh, I love the phrase, malignant snowflakes, to where every patient is unique and different in regards to their cancer and their, their mutational assay, uh, which specific patients were within the same histologic subtype. There's so many different mutations. 
uh, in so many different drug targets that would pop up on a, an assay to determine what drug might be m most successful. And so I think it's exciting, you know, but also somewhat disturbing in regards to how do we make sense of this moving forward. To even complicate matters further, uh, great data in regards to intratumor heterogeneity. So if this is a, a paper in the New England Journal of Medicine looking at renal cell cancer to where they basically took the primary tumor and they assayed multiple different small regions within the primary tumor itself. And then also took, you know, metastasis one at kind of a, a perirenal uh, met and then other in a lung cancer. Uh, metastasis and found that there was a large range of uh, differences within the primary tumor. It just depended on where you assay. So we think back when we send it off for a genetic profiling and molecular testing, where we sample that tissue is so important. And I think we all know clinically that metastasis are different in primary tumors just on the clinical behavior. And we've all seen the paradoxical responses to where we have multiple site, uh, multiple target lesions and we treat with, you know, chemotherapy X and we'll have some of the lesions get smaller, some of the lesions get larger, we'll have new development. And so it's a really it's, it's a conundrum on how do we move forward when we have such a paradoxical response and this is partially the reason why. And so I think having subtypes and diversification within the different individuals adds a layer of complexity to this. So, you know, can genome profiling of these, quote, malignant snowflakes, you know, can we move forward where every cancer is unique, specific to each patient, and it really becomes the treatment of the end of one, and, and that's a challenge. In newer technologies now, we're able to do single cell profiling. You can do RNA-seq uh, through, uh, you know, a certain company for cell by cell. And, and so now the debate is we have so much information, do we just lump it all together? We've got multiple cells within a tumor, do we lump it, do we cross-validate it? You know, or do we split it and give multiple therapies along each of those uh, molecular profiles? It really is a Pandora's box that we have opened, and the big question is, well, how do we interpret all of this? So again, I mentioned that treatment of cancer transition and even over to single cell. And, and one of uh, the guys who uh, gave us lectures during medical school used to say there's a, a significant difference on how MDs and PhDs learn, both of which learn a lot over the years. So if you take an MD, over the years, it's just volumes and volumes of information that we learn. And so eventually, you can't learn everything about everything, so you learn less and less about more and more until eventually physicians know nothing about everything. PhD is the other way around. They, over years, they learn a lot, but they learn more and more about less and less until eventually they know everything about nothing. <laughs> and, and I think that's true here. So we have, you know, the cookie cutter origin, you know, of chemotherapy and therapeutics. And as we learn more about less with learning histology, genetic profiling, single cell, you know, are we improving the outcomes along that, you know, continuum and our survival's improved? PARP's a great example. So, you know, uh, PARP, and I'm not going to go in great detail on the mechanism behind that, but, you know, it works really well in BRCA positive germline mutated patients in ovarian cancer. <laughs> However, if you look at the different histologies, you know, endometrioid histology, 8% of patients are, are BRCA positive in, in those cancers, 21% uh, in serous, and 19% in clear cell. So, PARP kind of extends across the three most common histologic subtypes of ovarian cancer. You move further and you look at BRCA, and so no doubt that patients who are BRCA positive, germline positive, have better response rates to PARP inhibition. But somatic mutations, you know, not necessarily hereditary, passed down, also have a pretty good response rate. Not as good as germline, but better than others. Uh, and then what about those who are wild type BRCA that have hypermethylation of the BRCA gene? So you have an increased activity and there's been some studies to suggest that those patients do just as well as a germline positive mutation. But they're wild type. And then you take wild type BRCA, now not everyone responds to it, but if you look at it, you know, per the indications where right now for certain agents, you know, third line or greater who are, are germline uh, positive, if you were to take negative patients and look at that, that same threshold, they respond about as well as, guess what, chemotherapy for patients three, four, or five lines down. And so, so if we, now, if it does work in all patients, granted there's some stratification of who, with the success rate, but if we have a response rate in all genetic genomic subtypes, even with wild type BRCA, and should we then try it in all patients? And if so, isn't that still cookie cutter? But now we're spending a lot more money and just classifying it differently than what we had previously. 
So that sound, I think up to this point, everything's been kind of negative. But I think I wanted to play both sides of genomic profiling, molecular profiling, because I do think it's a moving target. I do think it's the right thing to do. But so many levels, we're just not there yet. So um, can whole genome sequencing be the panacea for making precision medicine a reality? And, and I think that from a clinical utility, it's not if, it's when. Um, and, and usually what we see in, in medicine and everything else, there's a whole lot of hype uh, in regards to new things. We, ju we just like new toys. And, and, and the hype is usually followed by hard work uh, to demonstrate that it does add value to our patients. So, you know, making sense of, of all this and this cancer genomic, you know, data and, and volumes and volumes of files, you know, I think we have to understand certain principles. One, which, uh, what are the driver mutations? So you have a you know, molecular profile shows there's mutations, you know, and it, certain oncogenes and certain tumor suppressor genes are there. Um, but there's also passenger mutations. So these are multiple genetic changes, usually caused by genetic, you know, instability. So the more unstable or instable, you know, a, a certain cancer, cancer is, like ovarian cancer, uh, that those, that's not a fundamental uh, process of carcinogenesis or progression of disease, but can accumulate over time. So how, how do we discern, well, you know, what is a driver mutation, mutation? I think Nate, you know, he's got a great quote. He says, you know, I'm, I'm not sure how to define porn, but I know it when I see it. And so... Um, yeah, I was, actually, that, that that was a Supreme Court justice who said that, but but still funny story. Uh, but 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 it's true. You know what what is a driver mutation? It's hard to define, but man, I know it when I see it, and, and it's it's when we see those significant responses to quote match therapy. You know those those high spikes on the on the FDA chart where we see a significant benefit and gain over the standard of care. Those are the drivers, and those are the areas we really need to focus in on making sure the right patients, uh, you know, get the right drug at the right time. And so, you know, we need studies to distinguish the difference, and, and based on meaningful clinical endpoints, and those meaningful endpoints are survival, survival, and survival. Uh, not just translational endpoints, meaning, you know, does this agent hit our target and knocks down the target? That's important. We need to know that. But the survival should be the basis of us moving forward. So, you know, making sense, again, these actionable mutations a lot of times have therapeutic failures, and they have more than one driver mutation. So context of delivery matters, whether we do it in primary versus recurrent setting for genomic profiling, you know, which organs and specificity were HER2 new, really important in breast cancer, but in ovarian cancer, really not that important. We haven't seen the same type of, <coughs> excuse me, response with, you know, Herceptin and other therapies. And taking, in fact, you know, the tumor heterogeneity and, and also compensatory resistance. Just like antibiotics, any other drug, you know, you give enough of it, usually that tumor will be smart enough to have resistance mechanisms to change and alter, and thereby we have to alter our therapy. So, you know, you almost equate it to a, a subway uh, where there's multiple pathways that are there, and you need to get from A to B. And if one path is, you know, is construction or a path is blocked, then you find another path. You, you jump on another you know, uh, train and, and hopefully get to the point. And I think cancer is much the same. But can we use that knowledge you know, by, by compensatory mechanisms to then, quote, drive the driver? So you know, triple negative breast cancer is a pretty good example. So uh, you know, with, if you have triple negative breast cancer with an uh, upregulation of MEK, and then treat that patient with a MEK inhibition, it then uh, results in a loss of, you know, uh, ERK. Then that loss leads to C-MEK, you know, uh, dis uh, degradation. That C-MEK degradation then results in activation, actually, of other receptor, uh, other uh, tyrosine uh, kinase receptors. And so it has good intention. You knock it down to a certain pathway, but just like a negative feedback loop, it recognizes, hey, this is not working. I need to do something else to grow, to progress, and form angiogenesis. And so if you know that, can we take advantage of it, kind of force an escape pathway? So, you know, you treat a patient with a PI3K inhibitor, then treat them with an uh, AKT inhibitor, knowing that eventually the only pathway that's left, you know, is here that's going to lead to apoptosis. So can we help drive that driver? And we're seeing a lot of these treatments, these targeted therapies with sequential therapy where we start with, you know, agent A, hoping to force it to go to its escape pathway and then treating with that escape pathway targeted agent. 
Um, th these are, you know, clinical trials are needed for these study concepts, but it's really exciting to think that can we manipulate a tumor and really start to outsmart it. So with those trials, and I'm going to talk about a couple of them, I think this is the most important study I've ever seen. Parachute used to prevent death in major trauma related to gravitational challenge, systematic review of randomized controlled trials. So this is in a British uh, medical journal. They, they put out a spoof journal every December. And this is a spoof article on this. But in, in December sometime, just pull up this journal and look at it because you'll, you'll laugh your tail off. But their conclusions were parachutes reduce the risk of injury after gravitational challenge, but the effectiveness has not been evaluated by randomized controlled trials. We think everyone might benefit from a double-blind, placebo-controlled crossover trial, the effectiveness of a parachute, because it has not been studied yet. And, and it's silly but I think it's an excellent point because you can't study everything. Sometimes our, our you know, ethical, you know, clinical equipoise has changed to where it's not ethical or reasonable to study it, although it might be an interesting question. So I'm, I'm going to point to uh, a couple of, of things. You know, one, Dr. Pierce has been working with uh, the GOG NRG on cervical cancer and has learned from some of these lessons retrospectively on a couple studies. So these are both you know, randomized phase three controlled trials in cervical cancer. Uh, both were negative studies by survival. And so one was looking at phase three of chemo radiation, uh, and the randomization was, you know, uh, keeping someone's hemoglobin uh, at 10 or above without, you know, EPO, or using EPO to have a higher threshold of uh, oxygenation or hemoglobin of 12 with EPO use. The second study was, again, phase three randomized control trial with cisplatinum alone versus cisplatinum and terapazamine. Uh, with radiation therapy. So independently, both those were negative studies. Survivals were no different when you looked at it. However, as you stratify to what you know, Dr. Pierce uh, accurately states is the greatest biomarker is, is race. Um, and, and if you look at stratify based on race, in GOG 191, black patients that got EPO had much lower survivals than they without EPO. And so you can see here in the blue solid line, that's cisplatinum alone. Uh, and you see that line here. And so those patients without EPO did much better than the, the solid gold line here where they got EPO. Significantly different. This was not teased out until she looked at it, you know, after the study had been completed. And so those patients had significantly worse survival. Well, you, you start to look, and this is some of the hypothesis or theory, is that, you know, EPO and EPO receptor and, and enrichment in that and using that can actually lead to downstream uh, abnormalities in certain genes and actually confer a worse survival. And there's certain, you know, genetic uh, inherited based on race and ancestry in regards to what mutations or polymorphisms exist that kind of create these differences. The second study, again, was a negative study. It was cisplatin alone versus uh, cisplatin plus uh, terapazamine. And, and, and that's an agent basically was designed to treat in low oxygen levels, so kind of hypoxic tumors, which cervical cancer is a hypoxic tumor. And so it's only, that agent's only activated in the hypoxia low level of oxygenation. And, and what was seen here is that although <clears throat> it was a negative study, you can see in the, um, in the, in the black patients with just cisplatinum alone, uh, those patients did worse than those who got uh, terapazamine with cisplatin. And so it's kind of the flip uh, from the other. And so th these are two things we never would have thought about. They might go hand in hand. And I think it's really when we start to think about individualized therapy, we've got to look at, at, at patients and race and ancestry and to help learn some lessons and improve you know, really our study design. I think it's, it's going to become part of our study randomization stratification is we need to pick, you know, quote, special populations, whether it's, you know, Ashkenazi Jewish population, whether it's African American, uh, and, but divide, de define folks by genetic uh, alterations on how they get to be entered into studies. So, you know, personalized precision therapy, you know, Jennifer mentioned this a little bit with her immunotherapy talk, is that one exciting area is CAR T therapy. We're literally, we're, we're getting a transfusion, you know, taking patients' T cells and genetically reprogramming them to attack their own cancer antigens. That's exciting. I mean, you cannot get more personalized than that. And, and, and you look at a cancer cell and there's all different types of antigens that are on that. 
And, you know, can we do the same in solid tumor where we actually take, you know, harvest the cancer and do that? And so this is the vigil trial that Jennifer mentioned, and this is kind of a phase one trial we recently presented at SGO uh, of its personalized engineered autologous tumor cells in ovarian cancer. So not only is it targeted towards the surface of the tumor here, but also there, it's, it's a, a Trojan horse, if you will, that there's two other dual purposes of this vaccine. Is one, there's a stimulatory effect on the immune system to help you know, uh, stem factors to get more immune cells in the region. And two, there's also by decreasing uh, TGF beta, it actually removes that natural cancer inhibition. So cancer, you know, takes advantage of normal cell machinery, which our normal cells send out signals to say, hey, immune system, don't attack me, I'm normal, and please move along. Uh, well, cancer does the same thing, and actually they enhance that blockade. And so this actually removes that blockade, brings in more immune cells, and piggybacks that on this vaccine. So it is fascinating, uh, um, you know, methodology. So in this phase one trial, uh, there was you know, nearly 30 patients, I'll focus on the 23 of which were heavily pretreated patients with advanced solid tumors. They received you know, this vigil you know, vaccine. And then we, the patients you know, after the fact were uh, analyzed for what's called an Ellispot positive test. And that's a gamma interferon test to determine the activation of T cells. And so, it, so you have the vaccine, they took a tumor, they created a vaccine to it, and they put another piece of tumor in, in a Petri dish, put the vaccine in it and says, okay, what do the T cells do now? Do they really activate to that? So those that are activated, um, you know, obviously would do better. And so here's just the recurrent ovarian cancer subcohort, just that cohort of 23 patients. If you look at progression-free survival here, and those are L-spot positive, it was six months versus four months in a heavily pretreated group. If you look at overall survival in the same recurrent ovarian cancer, the difference was, you know, four months here uh, versus, you know, median not reached in the L-spot positive test. Now, in a full disclosure, if you stratify these patients between positive and negative, the, the negative patients or the L-spot negative tests had a much higher uh, average pretreatment. So they were 5.7 lines of prior therapy before this. Whereas the you know L spot positive were two lines of therapy, so that probably equates for some you know of the survival benefit. However, another lesson or another way of looking at this is we need to use immunotherapy a lot earlier than what we were thinking because if we wait until we beat on a patient's immune system for five to six different lines of therapy, immunotherapy might not be effective. And I think that's part of the fault not only in ovarian cancer but a lot of other cancers when they're looking at immunotherapy trials. They're all phase one on heavily pretreated patients. Their immune system is not robust enough to help, you know, as an adjunct to the vaccine or to immune blockade removal. So it's very important. So what did we do? Well, we, we did that study. Frontline ovarian cancer patients where they got their standard of care therapy and then afterward complete clinical response were then given a vaccine uh, up to six different uh, vaccine treatments. Now we completed enrollment on this study but just waiting for you know time and survival so we can report on it. But, but yeah, I, I think this idea holds water. So can genomic profiling improve the outcomes in clinical trials? If we specifically look at phase one studies, 10 minutes, could you stand up and do like the, like the in the rain? Um, round 10, ding, ding, ding. Um, so, so if you, if you, primary, primary outcomes of phase one studies is dosing. We want to figure out the dose and, and the maximum tolerated, you know, toxicity. Uh, but most also measure disease response because we want to know also is it somewhat effective. So traditionally, early studies of phase one show the response rate of anywhere five to ten percent. Uh, if you look at 1991, uh, Von Hoff did a meta-analysis of nearly 8,000 patients over a 14-year period and had, you know, 228 trials, and the response rate was 6% uh, in, in that cohort. Um, moving further along, 2005, another meta-analysis in Phase one studies, nearly 12,000 patients in 460 trials showed 11% response rate. However, if you break that down to if, if the phase one study incorporated at least one FDA approved, uh, the response rate was 18%, which is, which is reasonable for a phase one study. Well, in, in 2012, uh, in, in clinical cancer research, uh, another publication of phase one trials specific to those in a personalized medicine program. And out of those 460 patients, 
you had a matched molecular profile, meaning that in order to be in that phase one study, you had to have a genomic profile with an actual mutation that would be treated by that agent. And in that, we saw a significant increase, 27% response rate compared to 11% or 6% if you look at the decades preceding that. So with genomic profiling, can we improve upon survivals? You know, if we pick the right driver mutation, I say yes, we can. Uh, somebody said that before, didn't they? I'm sorry. Um, and then more effective agents, and I think by having more effective phase one um, uh, agents, we then develop more efficient pipelines. And if we have more efficient pipelines, then we have, you know, better cost, better survival, and that's what we're striving for. So I do believe we're getting there. It's just going to take some time. Uh, the impact slash compact trial, I think it's a great study, you know, molecular profiling of advanced solid tumors. And you can see here the different colors represent, you know, the different disease sites. It's hard to see, but you just got to trust me on that. And so this is a waterfall plot, and, and this is not measuring survival, which is how typically a, a waterfall plot is. This is measuring response rate. So anything that's going up, that means a tumor has grown in size. Anything going down, there's tumor shrinkage. So in A, this is a matched cohort. So like the match NCI trial, they had an actual mutation, and then they received an agent for that mutation. You can see the patients who had a response rate as you, on the right side of the graph. Um, and this is an unmatched, you know, cohort uh, of 150, and you can see that, that is, there's fewer patients that actually had a response. So I do think it's moving the needle. Uh, but we, again, we've got to focus on the driver mutations, figure out what those are, uh, and figure out which one are the, quote, passenger mutations are not really related to disease progression. I mentioned earlier ethnic diversity and cancer-targeted therapy and, and wanted to point out one of the things that we're doing in the lab is looking and defining race in different ways. There's, there's in, the, in the melting pot of, of America, you know, we self-designate as, as white, as black, as Asian, but there's a lot of differences that are there. And I, I joke with Mike Finan, if we were to look, we both consider ourselves white, but I'm, I'm two generations from Italy, and if I looked at my ancestry compared to his, he's, he's white as wonder bread. I mean, he's been over here for a long time, his family. You know, I, I without question, have higher African ancestry in my genetic makeup than him because of the proximity of Italy, you know, to northern Africa. And so, so, you know, we did that. We took a subset of patients who all had, you know, advanced stage ovarian cancer uh, at our institution and, and looked at different definitions of race. Self-designation, so uh, they declare themselves as white or black. The second was we took African ancestry. You literally can develop a percentage. So if we test pa patient X, they might have 25% of uh, North American, Amerindian as we call it. They might have, you know, 50%, you know, of European ancestry and then another, you know, 25 of, of African descent. So, so we defined it, one, by self-designation, two, we defined race by basically their tertiles. So if you lined up everybody from African ancestry from zero to 100% uh, based on their genome, and then each third represented a definition of race. And we also looked at it as a continuous variable. If there's 2%, 5%, all the way up. And so there were three ways of classifying. And one thing that was really interesting to us as we looked at this is that one, by a genomic profile, we could determine molecular signatures between, you know, what self-designation, de you know, white or black is. Uh, not self designate this is actually a, a, the tertiles, and so those who had, you know, tertile one and two are on this side, tertile three, so the highest ancestry, uh, with significant molecular patterns and differences compared to the other group. Uh, even furthermore, if we looked at a continuous, you know, African-American ancestry, uh, the most upregulated versus the tertiles, there were also significant differences in what genes and gene expressions were shown. In fact, there were only 5% of these genes, based on those three things, that were found in all three ways we classified race. And, and you look at the most down-regulated genes as well, significant differences. And so, well, how did that relate to survivals? Well, we looked at survival based on self-designated race, and they were statistically similar, 25 months versus 23 months. However, if you stratify by, by tertiles, in a, in a racial genetic ancestry race, where the third tertile, so the highest African ancestry, compared to all others, you can see those with higher African ancestry had worse survivals. And we see this, and it makes sense to us who treat, you know, GYN cancer, is that, uh, you, you know, every patient who come in, they, they, they see us, they're all treated by us, uh, they're randomized, on, you know, they're on trials, they have the same care 
but yet african american patients do worse it's a biologic genomic genetic thing i'm convinced and i think this data that we you know, put together supports that so you know now i guess moving forward let's talk talk about the practicality of things how do we multiple companies looking at all this and a great quote by T.S. Eliot, hell is the place where nothing connects and so there's a lot of data here that I think doesn't connect and we're in biomedical re research and now diving into patient medical records, EMR, you know we've got to be able to share data b better so how how do we move this path forward? I think you know one there's cancer panomics that cell you know special art or special journal is 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 you know hit it right on the on the nail uh, we need to learn how to use big data, and, and we got to share. We have to share with everybody. Everybody's got to take their databases. We have to take our IT expertise uh, and be able to use that and cross-validate, cross-validate. And then if we're able to do that, then I think the payment reform and value is going to follow, you know, follow very quickly behind. So, you know, one, we got to tackle complexity on cancer head-on in smarter ways. We need more basic science research, smarter clinical trials that really identify what are the driver mutations and really increase our population diversity in research. Uh, there was a study that we, one thing we found out in that racial disparity um, uh, evaluation uh, for genomics is that there was a certain, you know, in, uh, basically certain genes that control our immune system were significantly elevated in the African American community alone. And, we, and there's actually, there's actually a, a, a um, therapeutic for that mutation. And we looked at it, and we looked at the trials, and not a single African American patient was enrolled on any of the studies for that agent. But they're all about to close their pipeline because they say it's not effective, we don't see any benefit in this, and I think we're just studying it in the wrong people. So we have to be smarter about how we enroll in our trials. We all know the phenomenon of umbrella and, and basket trials. I think this is the right approach for large patient populations, you know, multi-institution collaborations, uh, and we're working towards that. Uh, e even at Mitchell Cancer Institute, we have a, a collaboration with uh, Caris and a Precision Oncology Alliance, where there's you know, 20 certain centers across the country, 12 of which have G1 oncologists, and so we're trying to do our part to make smarter studies. We also need to leverage health IT. So important to really realize they talk a whole different language. I don't, I don't understand a lot of times, but I trust them, and we just have to really figure out how we can dig into the data that's already available. It's the whole purpose of EMR. I know it's a pain in the butt for everybody in the room, but man, if we do it right and we enter things appropriately, it can be such a tool if everybody in the United States, we get access to see all the cancer patients, all the therapies they received, and, and that's how we're going to get to, to discoveries quicker. Uh, Cancer Link with ASCO is trying to do that, you know, by really bridging together all the different EMRs and to allow that data acquisition on treatments to see if we can get developed uh, better therapies. So, you know, the genomic landscape, 5,000 cancer, 10,000 cancers, it's changing. We need large collaborative networks and consortiums. We need biorepositories that are rigorously annotated and phenotyped and really need to be able to match the disease and normal specimens within that. Uh, the statistical analyses and large data sets are so important, but we have the capability now. You know, 10, 15 years ago, we did not have the big data interpretation that we do now. The pieces are there. We just got to work together to get it done. So it takes a lot of people, and what we hope is we're able to put all this together, then we're going to have rapid learning systems. Um, you know, we're, we're able to move the needle much more quickly to get things accomplished. I mentioned, you know, the different large data sets. You have, you know, a tweet here from NCI Match where they're, you know, uh, rolled over 6,000 patients. You can take that data set. All of us is a research program that's not only in cancer but all diseases by the NIH. So they have the goal of enrolling a million patients with disease states and doing full whole, whole genome sequencing to determine differences in uh, survival. Precision Medicine Initiative uh, by the NIH uh, also is looking to enroll hundreds of thousands of people. Uh, I mentioned Keras and then Cancer Link as well in regards to being able to put all that together. They all are right. They're all doing the right things. But man, we need to get, get all these folks talking together and sharing their data so we get answers quicker. And then, so, you know, probably the, the main reason for the talk, if you will, even though I pontificated a good bit, was, you know, the everyday philosophy for each physician. And I think we need to basically obtain these type of molecular profile tests within the confines of well-designed clinical trials. 
So if there's a trial that's available for our investigators out there or for our physicians, that is by far the number one reason to use this testing. Outside of that, you know, if there's even possible, you know, survival benefits to help determine which patients can get, you know, FDA-approved drugs or compassionate use, uh, I think that's, that's, there's a role for that. And, and, and I know it's costly, and, and I show the data for that, but that's the only way we're going to be able to move forward by picking these driver mutations. And it need to roll up our sleeves and just jump all in, you know, with Cancer Link in some way, somehow, community physicians, you know, can't, academic physicians, any provider out there. There's no reason why we can't be part of the solution and, and, and present our EMR and our data on our own patients uh, in a smart way so we can get better answers. And survival, I mentioned, is key, and we have to follow the guidelines. That It's complex, you know, but there, there are FDA, you know, guidelines. There's NCCN guidelines on when, how, and why to use these. Uh, but, uh, you know, I, I'm biased as part of, you know, clinical trials and what we do, and I do think it's the right thing moving forward. So progress, you know, depends on collaboration, an African proverb, to go fast, go alone, to go far, go together. Uh, and I couldn't be happier to work with the, my, uh, my group of folks uh, from Scalise Finan, you know, uh, Nate Jones and Pierce, uh, as well as our uh, nurse practitioners, you know, Minshew and Larry, uh, Mary Lucy and Luciana, who's our PhD, and our wonderful nurses that are some of which are in the crowd. So um, that's uh, like Forrest Gump. That's all I have to say about that. And uh, I'd be happy to take any questions or anything at this time. <laughs>